to the Fruit Anything podcast. This is episode 37. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We've got another great show ready for you today and we're really pleased to have you along with us to enjoy it. Our interview guest today is Daphne Marinopoulos, who is the founder of The Fibre Company. Yeah, this is such a great interview because we, apart from getting to know the Fibre Co. yarns better, Daphne gives us a, a little mini workshop on some of the more unusual fibres that she uses in her blends. So how these fibres work, why she combines them together, how they take to dye, because Daphne is an expert dyer. And right at the end of the interview, Daphne shares her ideas or thoughts on feminism and handcrafting. So you've got to stick around and watch this interview. I think it's, it's really informative. And we're going to be going to the former East Germany, to the beautiful city of Dresden, to meet Stephanie, our guest on Knitters of the World. So Stephanie is an opera singer. So apart from seeing her beautiful knitting, you're going to hear her beautiful singing voice. And you're going to get a really quick little glimpse of her in her makeup and her costume while she's waiting backstage, ready to go on to perform. Behind the scenes, that's really cool. It is super cool. We're going to be visiting the longest suspension bridge in Germany for our extreme knitting. Andrea's prepared a tutorial on knitting and yeah. we are announcing the winners of the Fruity You and Me Cow. So yeah. that's a lot to look forward to. If you want any details about anything that you've seen on the program, our full program notes are available at fruityknitting.com. But right now, I'm going to be leaving you. Yes. Because our daughter, <laughs> Madeline, is making a brief appearance. Bye. Bye. So we're going to have Bring and Brag now, which is our segment for showing off our finished objects. And we've got Madeline on the couch because she's finally finished her jumper. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I finished my Atlantic jumper by Sarah Hatton using the Rowan Softcheck DK yarn. And last time I was talking to you, I had finished all the pieces, so the front, the back and the arms, the sleeves. And then the task was to sew everything up together, which I had never done before. It took me a long time to actually get around because I was so busy to check her work and then to mm. teach her how to sew it up. And finally I did check her work and we sort of discovered. <laughs> what but did I'd we discover? <laughs> done another mistake, but it was only a small one. I misunderstood the pattern instructions for the top caps of the sleeves. Um, so I knitted a few more because I didn't decrease at the same time of doing something else. Um, yeah, so you took a longer time yeah. to decrease and so she had a very long cap. Yeah. <laughs> but that was fixed really quickly and then mum went on to showing me how to sew and she did the raglan sleeve parts of the sewing but I did the arms and the bodice. Yeah, the side seaming, seams. Yeah. Side seams, yeah. And the most difficult part of it was to make sure that the stripes line up with each other neatly, which I think they do. You did a really good job. They, they do perfectly. And we used yeah. backstitch, our trusty backstitch. Yeah. And apart from that, it was easy enough, although I did take my time because I wanted to make sure that it was really neat. Yeah. It was the first time that I did it, so. And then after everything was sewn up together, you just pick up the stitches around the collar and knit a couple of uh, rows and cast off, and you've just got this light little rolly edge. It, it looks really, yeah. uh, gives it a nice casual look to the jumper. So well done. And you're going to take that with you to Australia? Yes, in four weeks' time. <laughs> She's so excited to leave home and spread her ring wings and go on all these adventures. Yeah. Andrew and I are going to miss her terribly. And every day for the last couple of weeks, we've been going out for coffee, haven't we? <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Enjoying the time we've got before she goes. So you won't see her on the couch for probably five months or so. But maybe you might, uh... I might... I might send some footage over from Australia because I bought myself a camera and then maybe yeah. you will share a bit with A couple of your viewers. little adventures yeah. out surfing. Well, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Welcome back, darling. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm always relieved to still have a place, find a place on the couch. After Madeline's act. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, we are struggling a little bit with the idea of Madeline heading off into the big world. I guess it's inevitable and that's the way of things. Yeah. I did suggest to Madeline that I could come with her, but she didn't, <laughs> didn't really take to that idea. That wasn't really her plan. She doesn't want her dad hanging about. Yeah, yeah. and I said you could come with us too. And she thought that was but even still, worse. <laughs> still wasn't a, a goer for her, but yeah. 
It's amazing to see her grow up. Yeah, it's everyone hard. Says, it's hard to have, have have your kid leave the nest. Yeah, everyone says it goes really quickly, and it's really true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's it's gone really quickly. Yeah. Um, we have one fun bit of news to share with you. We were really chuffed to be featured in the newsletter from Rowan uh, Yarns. So Rowan has an electronic newsletter that they send out each month, and Fruity Knitting Podcast is featured a short interview with us. Yeah. Um, in the September edition, you can go to Rowan Yarns and check that out. Out. It is free. You can sign up, and it's a really great little magazine-style yeah. newsletter. Really worthwhile. Yeah, there's a lot in it. There's they've all every edition. They always include at least a couple of free patterns, and I think this month there's a pattern by Marie Wallen and a pattern by Martin, Martin Story, Story, two really top designers yep. for free. And there's a lot of different articles. They interview sometimes designers, sometimes yarn shops around the world that that are particularly beautiful. And I think there's an article on the catwalk and fashions. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's a really good uh, little magazine. And if you want to. Check us out. I know, us. Yeah. <laughs> On the other end of being interviewed, you yep. can you can have a little read of that too. But it was a real honour for us, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. We're still on Bring and Brag, and as you can see, I'm wearing my Manzanita tea by Romy Hill. I finally finished it. I totally love it. It's incredibly luxurious. The yarn I used was a Fiberco yarn, um, Road to China Light in the colorway Appetita. I think it's Appetita or Appetite. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. But... <laughs> um, um, don't know. Yeah. Don't know. It's, it's a gorgeous, luxurious yarn because it's, it's a blend of baby alpaca, silk, cashmere and camel. Probably that's, the most luxurious yarn I've ever that's used. That's so exotic. It's incredibly exotic. I feel like a million bucks. She does feel like a million bucks. <laughs> I've tried it. <laughs> I think it's because it's such an elegant pattern and with a luxurious yarn, it, it feels like... Yeah, such just... an elegant babe too, Dals. Thanks. <laughs> you do bring your own bit to it, you know. Yes, and I've got my special um, colourful handmade yeah. earrings on. Yeah, yeah, that look like Christmas beetles to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's what I always think of. Do you? Yeah. When I wear them, you they haven't told me like that Christmas before. Beetles. Yeah. Anyway, back to this gorgeous Manzanita yeah. tea. Uh, what did I want to say about it? It's got some fantastic little details, um, finishing tricks and, and tips. So I decided to make a very short tutorial on, on these little things because if any of you like the pattern and you think you might want to give it a go, I highly rec recommend it. Um, and maybe after seeing this short tutorial, you might be inspired to do it. I think it's a great way to constantly improve your knitting skills is to purposely go out and knit top designers patterns because they've always filled with different things, different ways of doing things. And I learned a lot through doing this. Mm. So, um, yeah, enjoy the video and enjoy the tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you on the other side. Romy Hill's patterns are full of wonderful details that make a garment feel really tailored and well finished. And I love this because it feels very luxurious to me to wear something that's been finished in a detailed and loving way. So many of you will already know how a Pico edging hem on a garment is made. But for those of you who haven't seen it yet, I wanted to show it to you. It's such a simple and effective way and a nice alternative to use on a hem when you want the garment to look extra dressy or pretty. So here it is here on the body of the Masonita T and also on the hem of one of the three quarter length sleeves. So they've both been sewn up and completed, but this sleeve here, I still have to sew up. This can be worked in a bottom up construction or a top down construction and you need just about two and a half centimeters of hem that you'll turn up underneath. But it's this row here of eyelet holes which is done just in one row and it's really simple. It's simply just knit two together, yarn over, knit two together, yarn over and you do that right around on one row and then continue on with stocking stitch and then you simply turn up the hem and you get this lovely scalloped effect. So I've turned up the hem and pinned it and now I'm just going to use a loose whip stitch to sew up the seam. And you want to just make sure that the whip stitch is loose enough so that the end cuff is going to be just as elastic widthways as the sleeve fabric is. So I just simply take 
uh, go down in one of the, the bumps, the pearl bumps on the wrong side of the sleeve and into the cast off edge like this. The collar on this garment is also constructed in a really beautiful way so I wanted to quickly show you. I've almost finished it but I've left a little bit to go so I can show you how to do it. So just to, to revise the body of the garment you start with a provisional cast on and you start with a lace section and you knit down and you complete the body and the sleeves. Then you come back and you pick up all your stitches where the provisional cast on was. You turn your garment inside out so the wrong side is facing you and then you knit a stocking stitch section to about that high and you turn it over and then that's going to be attached to the other side, so the right side of the garment to the top where the lace is. So I've done that all the way around the collar except for this little bit here. If you can see here I have got some uh, scrap yarn threaded through my very first row of the stocking stitch section and then I went through and picked up all of those stitches on that very first row on a very fine needle. So you end up having your live stitches which you finish off with at the end of your stocking stitch section and then you've got these stitches here which are at the, at the very beginning of the stocking stitch section and you're going to join them together. So I'm not going to knit any of the stitches. On both of my needles I have the same amount of stitches because these are just the stitches at the beginning of the, collar of the stocking stitch section and these are the stitches at the end of it and they'll line up exactly parallel. I then get a third needle and I join them together by slipping the first stitch on the front needle knitwise onto the right hand needle the first stitch on the back needle purlwise onto the right hand needle and then I just slip the first stitch over the top of the second stitch knitwise, purlwise, slip it over after the collar has been folded over and the top of the collar has been joined to the bottom of the collar you only have one needle with stitches on it and those stitches uh, bind off with a three stitch I cord bind off. If you haven't done that before you normally use a much thicker needle to do the binding off and you cast on an extra three stitches you put them on the left hand needle and you will knit the first two stitches so knit, knit and then the third stitch you're going to join together with the first stitch of the of the stitches that were on the on the body and you do that by knitting two together through the back loop once you've done that you put all of these stitches back onto the left hand needle and you start again so here it is finished I totally love it I just have to block out the lace section but it's such a classic finish you've got this beautiful lace that goes around the top of the shoulders you've got a gorgeous folded neckline which is sort of like a, a cowl the, here's the eye cord bind off which is this lovely thick rolled edge and then you've got the lovely pico edging on the three quarter length sleeves and the hem so I think it's such a classic classy design <laughs> Stephanie Hackhausen. I live in Dresden in Germany and I'm working as an opera singer. But besides that, knitting has always been a very important part in my life. I started knitting at the age of 12 and my mom taught me all the basics of knitting. Um, to be honest, there was no knitting tradition in the region where I was born, but I always was in love with fibers and colors and so I just ignored that and kept on knitting all the time and I 
knitted tons of garments, sweaters, hats, scarves and socks for everyone who wanted them. Knitting for me is a very enjoyable and creative process, but additionally it gives me the chance to create my own garments. Being an opera singer, I'm used to wearing well-tailored and individually designed costumes all the time and so in my private life I also aim to have individualized clothes and not being dependent on industrial production. In my personal knitting, I always had a great love for colors. So at the beginning, I was very much inspired by the works of the designer Kay Fisset. I bought his books, I own his pattern library, which gives you a huge range of patterns. And I read a lot about his way of selecting colors. And I will always remember his words. Whenever you're in doubt of selecting colors, take 20 more of them. And one project of this period is this blanket. It's a quite huge project and made of several pieces, individual pieces sewn together. And I took a lot of stash yarn combined together in different squares. And it's back with a very soft, cozy fabric and it's continuously in use in our family. So I still love it, it's quite wild and a way of colors, but anyway, very nice project. Another great technique for color lovers, of course, is the ferrile technique. And I'm doing that a lot because it's so, so creative and you can use a lot of colors and have a very, you got a warm garment and a very stable garment. And this is one of the cardigans I made. It's a shape of crystal cipher, the designer crystal cipher. But I personally um, changed the pattern, the chart and colors, of course. So here you can see something I like very much when choosing colors. It's warm colors and cold colors very nearby. They give a nice contrast and here you have the oranges and the pinks. I love this very much. It's a very warm cardigan. And another one I did in ferrite technique is this sweater, which is completely my own design, completely shaping and charts and everything. And as well, here you can see I have warm and cold colors together. Again, it's <laughs> orange and pinks together, which I like very much. And in this garment, I got in more contrast. You see, it's almost black and white over here, which is very bright and shining. And for shaping, I did short rows um, to get a higher neck. And it's a continuous method set in sleeve. So. Lately, I'm very much in love with the designs of Stephen West, who goes beyond all conventions of shaping garments. And as well, he's in love with speckled yarns, who are very popular at the moment, and so I'm too. One of the garments uh, he designed and I, I knitted is this cardigan. As you see, it's a lot of short rows and uh, round shaping over here. And I really love to wear this all the time. It's not too slippery and very elegant. I'm very much in love at the moment with edge of fibers. And you see they, they are so beautiful over here and have so many different colors in. But if you make a, bar, uh, a ball out of them, you see immediately that they have a basic color. And it's only little little spots of other colors. And so actually in the garment, they stay with their color. And see, for example, here I made a little sweater for my son. And I used a speckled yarn over here. And together with other colors, it stays a gray sweater. And it's just a simple Raglan sweater. He loves it very much. But I mean, isn't it nice to have the speckled in it? <laughs> and finally, the cardigan I'm wearing at the moment is completely my own design and also made from speckled. It's cashmere, speckled cashmere from Edge of Fibers. And I had two different colors. It's the turquoise over here 
and then this um, beige, more beige, and I faded them one into another and made my own shape. Top down, and it's my favorite garment at the moment. So thanks for letting me share my projects with you. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for being such a great knitting community. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for sharing your knitting with us and also for the glimpse of the backstage scenes there with your costume and makeup, everything happening there. That was really fun. That was great. <laughs> so how you saw Stephanie in her costume, she was uh, performing the role of Agatha in the opera Freischutz. And this character, Agatha, right at the beginning of the opera, um, she gets hit in the head by an old painting that falls down and, and hits her. So that's why Stephanie was wearing that blood-stained bandage around Bandages. her head. Yeah. And the gorgeous singing that you heard is also Stephanie singing, and she's singing a very famous um, opera aria called Song to the Moon, and it's from the opera Rizolka by Dvorak. And Rizolka is an opera based on a Slavic fairy tale which has strong parallels to the fairy tale The Little Mermaid because it's about a water sprite who falls in love with a human prince. And that particular song that she was singing, Song to the Moon, Rizolka, the water sprite, is singing to the moon and expressing her love and hoping that the moon can tell this prince of her love for him. So it's absolutely stunning music. It's gorgeous singing. Go back and listen to the last couple of minutes again because now you understand what it's about. Go back and listen. It's really heart-wrenching, yep. beautiful music. Yeah. This is Under Construction where we present the projects that we're currently working on and I can bring this up now. In the last episode, we mentioned that I would be continuing my brioche adventures with this pattern here, which is Paris's Scarf by Nancy Marchant. It's a combination of brioche and double knitting. Um, and we had in the last episode also mentioned the, or we showed the yarns that I was going to be using. In the last week or so, Black Yarns sent us a couple of samples of a new limited edition yarn that they're bringing out, their birthday edition. Um, called brushwork. Called brushwork. And we've decided that that would be really good for this scarf here. So we've changed our plans and that's what we're going to be using for this project. Um, yeah. This yarn is really interesting. Yeah, it's called brushwork. It is a limited edition. The reason for that is that the wools that are in here are quite hard to get. Um, it's a combination of Scottish Beaumont, which is a, a cross between a Shetland 
and a Saxon Merino. So the Shetland is there to make a nice hardy sheep, which is suitable for living in Scotland. And the wet Merino, climate, yeah. yeah, wet climate. And the Merino is there to give you a really fine yarn. So I think this is like an 18 micron yarn here. Yeah, it's it's normally in high demand for luxury garments. That's right. So it's place. not it's not a terribly common sheep, and it is really very much in demand for for nice garments. So that's quite special here. It's been combined with a castle milk moret. Yeah, which, uh, which is, is a rare breed. It's a rare breed. There are apparently less than a thousand of these sheep around. You see the pictures, they've got these big horns. They're really, really original, authentic looking sheep there. <laughs> it is a moret, which means that it's kind of a reddy brown color. Um, the combination of the lighter um, yarn from the, um, the Scottish Beaumont, Beaumont yeah. and the Castle Milk moret gives you a dark and light yarn, which means that you've got a really heathered effect on the um, the colours here, which is beautiful. I think it's really nice. And the colourways are all named after painting techniques or processes. Yep. And, color, and um, watercolour. Yep. So this one is called Velatura, which wasn't a term that we were familiar with. So you looked it up, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And, and it means? Uh, let me think again. It's sort of like... You t- what I is can it? say, yeah. all right, what I got was, I mean, I'm not a painter. You've done painting. Yeah, I know, but um, I haven't done this technique. No, it's it's when you get what you've got one layer of paint on and then you put a very thin layer of a different yeah. colour on top of it to sort of, it, it looks like a layered effect and, like and a, a bit glossy. Like a milky glaze, yeah. yeah. So We've got four balls of this to give away as a prize for our fruity you and me cow, which is yes. coming up very shortly. Yeah, so there's eight um, shades and you can get your shade card now if you like. Um, but the yarns won't be available to buy until the 28th of September, but it is a limited edition. I think they're gorgeous. They all do look a little bit like watercolours. And when I saw this colour here, which is called Splosh, I haven't heard of a, a painting technique outside of kindergarten called Splosh. Maybe it's similar to splashing It makes me <laughs> paint think of, on. what is it, Jackson Pollock? Yeah, maybe. I reckon Jackson Pollock Did might have splosh. done a bit of Splosh. Yeah. <laughs> This is such a stunning, crazy, iridescent yellow. Andrew thinks green. it's green. It's green. So we've bought a couple of these um, to go with the, the blue, which were which was sent to us, and I think it makes a great colour project, yeah. doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, so just looking at the project itself, this is the Paris Scarf by Nancy Marchand. Um, I didn't knit this. Andrea knitted this, and the reason for that is this is a combination of brioche, which is these nice vertical sort of knit and pearl rib columns here but this section here is actually double knitting and neither Andrea nor I had ever done double knitting before so Andrea was very responsible and said that she would figure out how to do it first and only then she would teach me yeah so I you've thought actually that's only fair <laughs> and you were actually planning to do a full repeat of this pattern which is 36 rows but I don't think you need to do too much Dale so I think you've got the hang of it and you can <laughs> it's actually it very addictive I have to tell you it's, yeah. um, it's easy just to start and, and just you want to keep going. Yeah. So I will hand it over to Andrew, but I think we need to photocopy the chart and make it a little bit enlarged. If you don't like working from charts, Nancy has written this pattern both in a written form and a charted form. So you've got that both of those as options, but I do think charting is much easier to see the overall effect of, of what you're doing and it gives you a feeling that actually it's not a hard pattern. Yeah. The Fruity You and Me Cal came to a close at the end of August and we're now ready to announce the prizes. The idea behind this cow was that you knit a garment or a, a shawl, a large shawl for yourself and something for a loved one. Yeah. And these two garments, when you're wearing them or when your loved one is wearing them, you think of each other and you think of the relationship. And it's been and really fun. It, yeah. And celebrate the relationship, yes. <laughs> and it's been really fun to watch. People have really got into it and and given their all. And and got some fantastic connecting stories, you know, how they've the the relationships that they're celebrating and the stories of how they're connecting it and what's the meaning behind. Yep. And so we wanted to share a couple that we found particularly inspiring because there's a sheer amount of work that goes in into this. It's, yeah, it was a, a more challenging cow yeah. because it's it's two garments involved. Two in garments or two large shawls yeah. or something. Yeah. So, so the first one we wanted to um, talk about is Rosie, and you might remember Rosie. She was a guest on Knitters of the World in episode twenty six. Rosie knitted a sonic hedgehog jumper for herself and one for her unborn baby. 
It was based on a favourite childhood jumper, which was knitted to her for her by her gran, and her gran knitted one for her and her two brothers. There's a picture here of, of the three of them wearing it. And so Rosie tracked down the original pattern and her husband helped her, helped her make a chart for the little version. That is super cool. This is, I think this is so cool. I love, I'm a bit nostalgic and I love the picture of Rosie and her brothers when they're yeah. all young. And the idea of bringing this on to another generation. So her grandmother's knitted one and, and now the, the great-grandchild will yeah, get one. We'll I get mean, one. that's, that's, that's so super cool. cool. Yeah. Yep. So Justina from Poland also, uh, we want to talk about her because she entered a few times and she's actually going to, uh, she came up for winning one of the prizes. She's going to get uh, four of the brushwork balls of yarn from Blackie Yarns we've just spoken about. And she knitted two little cardigans for her two boys and she designed the pattern herself and then she combined the leftover yarn from her little boys' jumpers with a tweedy yarn and knitted herself a matching shawl. And I just have to say her little boys look so cute. They are very sweet and the, the, I love the design of the, the cardigans, design is, the, the is, sort of blocks of yeah. colour. It's gorgeous, it's, yeah, really gorgeous. Really well done. And then for her second entry, she knitted three matching vests. So one for herself and one for her daughter and one for her daughter's little doll. And all of those vests were, were knitted in her own hand-dyed yarn, which she dyed based on the colours of all the berries she's been picking over summer. And there's a picture there of her with a big basket full of gorgeous berries. And that is such a, a Northern European summer yeah. activity, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. We didn't get to do that this summer. No. And then finally... The last um, entry that I want to talk about is uh, Stephanie. This is a really touching one. Her grandfather passed away earlier this year and she wanted to create something that would connect her grandmother, her aunt and her mother, the three women that her granddad left behind. So she knitted each of them a Drachenfels shawl in their favourite colours. And you've knitted the Drachenfels shawl yes. and it is... A, there's a lot of knitting in there's that. a lot of stitches in those three shawls and they're yeah. really beautiful i checked out the pictures there yeah so now for the prizes so justina won the um the black blacky black yarns, yarns yep. brushwork the next prize that was donated to us was very kindly donated by made by ganache and it's this beautiful uh project bag and the winner for that came up Buckaroo. Buckaroo from, from New, New South, South Wales. Wales, Australia. And she used Tannis Fibre Arts pattern as an inspiration to knit a cardigan for herself, a cardigan for her mother-in-law. So she entered those two and she's still working on a cardigan for her mother. I mean, that, again, is another stellar effort yep. of, of amazing marathon knitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's great to see people doing stuff for other people. Yeah. And then finally for the third prize... Russell, who is Bisto Boy 1 on Ravelry, he came up for the third prize and we're donating that prize. It's going to be the e-book by Tin Can Knits called Heart on My Sleeve. It's a book of eight sweater patterns from nine different designers and the proceeds of the sales of this book go to the Against Malaria Foundation. So all the designers in this book donated their patterns and Tin Can Knits coordinated the whole project. And we just thought it was a fantastic book to represent the feeling of the you and me, Carl. So thank you so much to all the participants. Everyone who entered, they did a great job. There's so many more projects that we'd love to share with you. So if you haven't seen them, go across to that thread there's some fantastic yeah, so the, stories behind the connected project yep yeah. so the fruity knitting podcast group on ravelry you can look there and there's a thread for the cow itself and for the finished objects the pictures are really cute yeah yeah it's worth <laughs> a look um it'll put a smile on your face yeah we're going to take a quick break now stretch our legs and we're going to visit the longest cable suspension bridge in germany it's quite spectacular we didn't actually do any knitting on the bridge because on the day it was a beautiful day it was very busy a lot of tourists from all around the world we could tell yeah so we couldn't exactly stand in the middle of the bridge and, and block it to do our knitting yeah and but i jack and i had vertigo in extreme jack, yeah. so I, I i started on the bridge and i just couldn't do it so Jack and I sat to the side and we uh, I had a knit, he didn't have a knit. <laughs> so enjoy yep. it and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. 
welcome back. We would like to remind our Shetlands that we have a live event coming up on the 8th of September with Andrea Maori. We interviewed Andrea in episode 33. If you haven't seen that interview, it is worth checking out. Andrea is lovely. She tells us about her design journey. It's very interesting. For Shetlands and Merinos, if you have questions for Andrea, please get them in as soon as possible so that we can give that to them to her so that she can check them out. Yeah. And we'd like to thank all of our patrons for your ongoing support. We really appreciate it. Preparing the content for this show and the supporting website is full-time work for me and Andrew helps me on top of that. So we do ask you, if you enjoy our show and you really value it, please become a patron. Thank you. We're now up to our interview with Daphne Marinopoulos. Daphne's become very knowledgeable on how different fibres work together. And typically the Fiberco yarns have wonderful and unusual fibre blends. So if you're a spinner or you're a yarn dyer, I think you're going to find this interview particularly informative and interesting. Yep, Daphne has a huge experience in that area, in the whole fibre area. She does also have a an entire history apart from the fibre company and it's interesting to hear about that and how yeah. it all comes together. Yeah. So enjoy the interview. Yeah, and we'll see you in two weeks. So thanks for spending time with us. Yeah, thank you very much for being with us today. We'll see you next episode. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. My guest today is the founder and owner of the fiber company, Daphne Marinopoulos. Daphne had a very successful corporate career, but in spite of this success, she had a long time dream to be creatively working with her hands. So in 2003, she took the plunge and bought a mini mill in Portland, Maine, US. And she started on a very small scale spinning and hand dyeing unique fiber blends herself. But since then, she's moved her company to be based in the UK and she's working with a variety of producers and artists to create very exquisite and beautiful yarns which are now known worldwide. So Daphne, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you and a warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Andrea. Like I said, you had a long career in the business corporate world. And I just want to add also as, as a bit of interest, you worked as a commercial pilot, which um, is very interesting. So despite that varied career, you, um, which was not at all related to fibre and textiles, your family background has been deeply rooted in textiles. And I imagine that that um, background and the knowledge from that would have been a good support for you when you first of all started. So tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Andrea. My grandparents were immigrants from Greece to the United States in the early 1900s, and they settled in New England in the center of the textile mills. And they both worked in uh, an old cotton mill there called the Boot Cotton Mill. Um, and uh, because that area was the way it was, um, there was a university that specialized in textiles, and my father went to that university, became a textile engineer, and worked for the DuPont company for his entire career as a textile engineer. So he was around me when I was growing up, and my early days um, in career aspirations was to be in the fashion and textile industry, but I was kind of directed away from that to something a bit more serious. and. Uh, so I did. I went off and I had spent most of my career in financial and general business management. And then 
in uh, 2002, there was an opportunity for me to take a break and and assess and do something very different. And uh, one thing led to another. I found out about this mini mill that was available. And so I bought one and uh, and then suddenly I was in the textile business. I can imagine that having the mini mill really allowed you to experiment with um, blending different yarn fibers and alongside that you were also experimenting with hand dyeing. So tell us about that because that sounds very interesting and then go on to tell us how you managed to take it from a very small scale operation, just you doing everything, to a lot more mass production um, where you were able to produce enough to supply stores with yarn that were around the world, but you still kept this artisan quality of unique fibre blends and um, very artistic hand dyeing. So that's quite a journey. So t talk about that. That's exactly the way it happened. Uh, the mini mill that we had is there was no pretense about it being a super efficient um you know, series of, of machines to operate. So what it allowed me to do was to experiment and not worry about the time that I would spend. I literally stood at the carding machine and weighed in fibers of various different qualities um, and types to then just see what would come out at the other end and spin it and then eventually take it to the dye pots and see how all these different blends would react. Um, it was not a very efficient process, and in fact, at the time, there weren't many yarns, like we see today, quite a few that will have three, four fibers blended in, into one yarn. At the time, we, there weren't really that many. So I think what ended up happening was we found a little niche, and it was a good novelty, and, and some of it was for very real reasons that we blended things to get a certain effect in, in, our, in our yarns as they came out. And uh, uh, not only did I, when I started, not know much about textiles from, you know, how to spin and dye and all that, but also didn't know anything about the industry at all. And so I didn't really have a plan for how we were going to sell this yarn, but I tried a few things and we ended up in this wholesale distribution model, which meant that I needed more yarn uh, to meet demand than this mini mill was capable of producing. So we quickly found ourselves in uh, the need of outsourcing some of our production. Uh, so I knew I was going to need some help on the dyeing front as well. And uh, I had been reading a lot about Peru and I learned that there were uh, there was a very large, long tradition of hand dyeing um, and in particular using plants to, to dye fibers with. So I became intrigued and I started asking the supplier, uh, could you not help us source, you know, this? Are, are there still people doing traditional dyeing in Peru and can you help us with this? And it was just uh, the right time to be asking that question because several other yarn brands were also asking that same question of the mill. And they had already started working with a group of local artisan dyers. So it was just a process of sending our yarns, telling them what we did to create ours and saying, can you get this effect? Can you do this with the processes and equipment and dye stuffs that you have? The early results were really disappointing. There were two, three times we, we went through it and we weren't getting it. And I just thought, if I can do it, they can do it. They're probably way more experienced than I am. So I suggested that I go to Peru and um, work with the dyers to try and come up with a solution um, to get the same results. And we worked through it and, and did. And so then that allowed us to um, provide a, the product to the customer uh, in a time frame that was much more uh, desired. Yeah, so that would have been a very interesting experience to work with them. So now as a business owner, you'd have a lot of tasks to do, but I have heard you say that your real sweet spot is to be able to still play with colour and spend time with colour. So tell us, what was your journey like right from the beginning? Like how did you first learn to hand dye yarn? And then What's it like for you now when you're bringing out your yarn and you're developing a palette? Like, what's your inspiration? Uh, maybe you can talk about that as well. Originally, when I first had the mill, we didn't have dyeing capacity. I had because I didn't know how. So what I did for color in the early days was I used a lot of naturally fiber, uh, naturally colored fibers, and then I would mix in colors of dyed uh, merino that I could purchase. And so we got color initially that way. And I started really thinking about color and getting involved with it. 
And I realized that the color was almost as exciting to me as the tactile nature of working with fibers, which was my initial draw to um, you know, the fiber arts. So I thought, well, I must learn how to dye. <laughs> so how am I going to do this? So I found a workshop and it was a, an intensive three day workshop. And it, what was really nice about this workshop was that after we went through the initial um, principles of how to dye, we then set about as, as a team of other participants and we worked on a particular area of the color wheel. And then at the end of the workshop, we made enough samples for everybody to take home. So I actually ended up with a reference library of over, um, over a thousand colors. I, I have it here. Uh, I literally have this in a shoebox. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and, and it looks like this. And this shoebox is full to the bottom with just pages and pages of colors that we shared at the end of this workshop. And this is my starting point today. Um, uh, some of my early work looked like this, where I would take fibers and dye them and blend them, and then I would refine them, and they would end up looking you know, a little bit more refined like that. But I still, to this day, like to work in the lab environment. And so when I'm starting, if it's a, if it's a yarn that's going to be dyed, uh, yarn dyed as opposed to dyeing the fiber first, I will get small samples of a yarn and I'll set up a lab and I mix the dyes and I usually start with that library as a reference and I just start developing colors. There was a yarn I did um, a couple of years ago where these is, this is the results of my lab work here. Uh, there were 85 colors that I tried and we launched the product with 14. And um, the idea of for colors in the fiber company has always been about having a palette that's uh, quite balanced. I mean, uh, certainly naturals and neutrals sell really well, but it always felt uh, unbalanced to me to have a yarn and say, uh, well, we just have a few colors. I, I always really thought of it. It may have been that I just, you know, wanted to map out that color wheel at some uh, depth of shade and, and have each yarn have its own uh, look and feel for a palette. Um, but there's usually an idea. There's a sense of place in behind most of our yarns. And there's usually an idea for a palette. There's something that will drive me in a certain direction. This basket of colors here, this is in our Cumbria yarn. And uh, the idea was that we live in this area called Cumbria in Northern England that has very deep blues and, and um, intense greens and uh, beautiful reds and purples from the heather that's just now starting to bloom in the hills. So I wanted it to look like that. So there's usually a theme behind the palette and um, often a sense of place. Um, and the color, the, 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 the fun thing for me is that although I don't um, you know, do the milling myself anymore, I do get to get very hands-on with color development. Yeah, and you have absolutely stunning colors and many of Thank them are, are quite um, marbled or heathered. In, yeah, so you'll have a variety of, of tones within them. That's, that's what I've noticed. So that's, that's very that's conscious. Definitely, it's a it's a very it's a very conscious effort to get something other than just quite a simple flat color because, um, well, when you're hand dyeing, it's quite easy to get uh, variation in, in color um, because you're you can't quite control it the way it is in an industrial process. Now, um, I've talked a lot about the hand dyeing process, but we do have yarns in our range today that are not hand dyed; they are dyed industrial industrially, but we still do something in the process that will allow us to achieve um, some depth of color that you can get uh, by varying fibers and uh, varying the actual base color that you're starting with, such that um, the light will catch the fibers in a certain way, the dye will strike the fibers in a different way, and these colors play with each other to give something that has some, some real depth to it. So let's now talk about fibres because as your company name suggests, <laughs> it has a strong focus on fibres and you've gained quite a lot of information and knowledge over the years with unusual fibres. So could you just go through some of these fibres that you use and perhaps tell us what are they like, how do they behave by themselves, what are their individual properties and then what do they do when, they're, when you mix them or why do you put them together so that people or knitters can better 
uh, match their yarn to their projects? Yeah, let's have a little mini one on one 101 <laughs> fiber uh, workshop, okay? Um, I'll start with mohair because mohair is a really beautiful fiber. Now, mohair comes from the Angora goat, uh, not to be confused with the Angora rabbit, which is also a fiber producing animal. And this is an example of some very fine mohair I happen to be working with right now um, on, a, on a blend that I'm working on for mm, two seasons hence. But mohair is, is a very smooth fiber. You and uh, might know that um, wool has, it, it, as a fiber, will have scales on it. The scales on mohair are, are very limited. And because of that, it's very smooth. And then the way the light strikes, strikes mohair as a fiber, it's, it presents or returns a, a very lustrous color. And so we use it to add sheen to a fiber. Um, and it may also be used for strength because uh, some of the stronger, more what we call adult mohair is very, very strong. And often because the fiber lengths are quite long, that again adds strength to it. So uh, the mohair that we use in one of our blends is comes from Argentina. Uh, but there are several growing regions around the world. There is often a tendency with um, producers to use mohair in a brush capacity because it can easily be brushed because of that straight fiber. It doesn't tend to curl and go into a twist as much. So you can brush it and some of these fine, smooth fibers will come out, create a fluff, and it's very warm. And it creates that warmth and softness, but yet it's very lightweight. So you can have a whole... Uh, sweater uh, made from 100% mohair. It'll be very lightweight, but yet keep you very warm. Cumbria is a blend uh, of mohair, only 10% mohair, but it's also a blend of merino wool. And it's a blend of a wool called Massam that comes from the Massam sheep breed. It's an English breed that is come from uh, a ewe that is a, called a Swaledale and a ram or the male uh, sheep that's called a teaswater. It's actually a rare breed, the, not the Swaledale. And then the resulting breed of Massam is not uh, a rare breed. But what's nice about it is that it produces a multicolored animal. So it can come in either a white or a light gray or this dark gray. Okay. And our idea was to use the darker gray, blend it with a white merino and add 10% mohair. Well, why the 10% mohair? I've already mentioned the sheen that mohair gives. Yeah. We knew we were going to be dyeing this product on an industrial basis. And oftentimes uh, a merino wool or just a plain wool of any kind, just dyed industrial can have a very flat matte look to it. And the fiber company has always been about that look with hand dye or, or depth of color. And so I thought, well, if we use the brown um, massum wool and we blend that with some white merino and add that 10% mohair just to give it some luster, the goal of this yarn was to have it be more of a workhorse yarn. We had, until we made this yarn, mostly just very luxurious fibers in all of our yarns. The kind of garments you might make with that, you wouldn't want to wear necessarily every day or they would wear out much quicker. Yeah. But we wanted to have a yarn that we'd say, Let's make a sweater and wear that every day on, you know, the school run or whatever yeah. your da daily take um, happenings take you to. So the result from that is a dyed color that, although it's industrial dyed, it has a lot of depth of color. You see a little bit of the gray from the uh, massum coming through, and then in different lights, you can see the sheen from the mohair. And uh, and that leads me to this this beautiful uh, piece, which is um, silk. And silk is a fiber. It does. It comes from a silk worm. There are two types. Uh, they produce a continuous um, fiber that's in a cocoon, and it will come either from uh, what is known as a mulberry silk or a tussa silk. And the mulberry silk takes its name from the fact that these worms are cultivated, and they're given uh, mulberry leaves to eat, and it produces a very white fiber. And it's um, you know, cut to length and it can be cut to whatever length that is desired for the strength that's intended. In fact, uh, silk can be used for its strength property, although it's so soft, most people don't think that softness can also produce strength, but it really does. And the um, the first parachutes were, were made with the yeah. silk fabric because of its strength. 
And so silk is, um, the other type of silk, tussa, is, is actually grown in the wild. And these silk worms feed on whatever leaves and things that are in the forest. And so they pick up the natural tannins and the result is not a white uh, product like this, but quite a golden one. There's still some sheen, but not as sheen and it tends to not be as soft, but it does, it can create interesting effects um, in the dye pot using, using tussa silk. So we de definitely use silk for its dye properties. And it will, because there are no scales at all on the fiber, it creates a very, um, very lustrous um, and soft, but from a dye perspective, it will create very bright colors, just the way the light reflects it because there are no scales. A byproduct of spinning silk is silk noil. And this is an example. You could probably unfold this and almost see where it came off of a, um, a carding roller okay. and silk is very fine but or very long filament as I said a continuous filament but silk noil it, are all the short fibers that get broken off so that they can get very fine silk threads for say weaving and the the reason this is a byproduct is because this would create an unevenness in a fabric um, and silk noil it could also be known sometimes people refer to it as raw silk or silk borette yeah. And this product, the reason we use it is that if you blend this with other fibers with generally longer length, it will create a little imperfection in the yarn. And it usually looks like a little slub. Um, there are machines that will do slub yarns, and they're, but they're very regimented. Yeah. And you'll see every so often there's another slub. Well, with silk noil, it will create random slubs. And that was our goal. And this was actually the, the one of the first fibers I used for one of our first yarns was I wanted to see the effect of a yarn that would occasionally have these blobs of silk in it mixed with merino. And then I also mixed it with a baby alpaca. And in when you put something like that in the dye pot, you can get some really interesting effects because between the temperature and the pH of the water and some of the fixatives that you use for dyeing, you can get dyes striking um, different fibers differently, and especially if you're using compound mixtures of dye stuffs, in other words, many different colors within one recipe, perhaps the yellow will come out and strike the silk differently than it will the, 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 the merino wool. So you might get a, a brighter uh, blue on the silk and be more like a green on the wool or vice versa, depending how, on what how you're... How wonderful. That's really yeah, exciting. So, so that was that was the fun uh, part that I had, um, you know, learning to dye and then having something to use. Because I remember at that workshop, there were people who were also just like me, complete newbies, and they didn't know where they were going next on their dyeing journey. And I'd actually brought this yarn that I had made, and I asked the instructor, I said, can I try a few with this yarn? I was just on cloud nine, thrilled to death. I couldn't wait to get back and set up my, yeah. my dye studio and start working because I knew I was I was really going to have something that was a lot of fun to work with. And that yarn is still in our collection today. It's called Terra. And it really is, a, um, I tell people, if you want to kind of know what the fiber company is about, have a look at our Terra yarn because that kind of describes what we try to um, achieve, you know, interesting um, palettes and unusual effects of color and light and hopefully something that somebody wants to knit with too. But, yeah. um, so um, let's see what else I've brought here is, uh, yeah, a, a couple of other fibers. A lot of people have never really seen linen in its raw form. This is linen. It comes from the flax plant. And uh, you can see that it's kind of a tan color here, but it also can be ivory colored or a light gray. And basically what happens is this flax plant, which some of the finest flax is grown in, in Western Europe, um, the plant is, is um, well, it's processed and such that the core will come out in these, in these beautiful lengths of, of natural fibers that can be twisted and spun. And uh, if you just spin linen 100% by itself, you'll have an interesting yarn. 
Um, and it will be something, though, that knitters will find a little bit rough on the hands. Yeah. Uh, depending on how it's spun, uh, they're doing nice things with linen yarns and making chainette yarns and different things to keep them easier to knit with. But I was really attracted to the idea that these fibers were completely natural in their length and, and that they varied in length. And that if we took this and blended it with other fibers, um, how what would it do? And I had this, this sense that there would, there would be a rustic uh, quality to the yarn. And so I, I thought about that and I, was tr I could not spin just plant fibers with our mini mill because it wouldn't do cotton, but I could use a little bit of cotton. I could use a little bit of linen, could use a little bit of silk and I could use wool. So we came up with our first uh, yarn that was kind of a blend of both protein fibers and plant fibers and I use linen and the result from from using the linen is this kind of rustic look that um, uh, again it, it doesn't necessarily create an uneven yarn but some of these fibers will um, stick out a little bit. Um, I had a customer write to me a couple of weeks ago and she said I'm so disappointed with one of one of your yarns. It has these fibers; they're sticking out all over the place. And <laughs> and I, <laughs> so we had a lovely conversation, and, and we had actually a little bit like this workshop right now talking okay. about fibers, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And I and I told her that actually what ended up happening for us of working with these different fibers is I found that the look either fell into this kind of bucket of rustic luxury, or it fell into you know, smooth, um, luminescent, uh, soft luxury fibers. So it was one or the other. And I told her, I said, you know, it's not for everybody, but we definitely had some other yarns for you. And I, I talked to her about our smooth yarns and, and she was like, yeah, that's up my alley. <laughs> um, but we use some other luxury fibers as well. Um, uh, a really, sorry, a really quick yep. question. Yes. How was it with the dyeing when you're combining animal and plant fibers together? Because th they both take dye differently, don't they? So that would have also added another interesting uh, layer to, to the final look. Am I right in, in thinking that? You're exactly that? right. You're exactly right. And in that yarn that, we, that I was telling you about, that blend where we did 50% plant fibers, 50% protein fibers, we ended up not, uh, not dyeing the plant fibers. So uh, that gave a very heathered look to it. Similar to that impact that we had, as I was describing with the Cumbria yarn, getting that heathered look because of the naturally dark colored yeah. wool. This, because of the different um, uh, ways that protein fibers dye and plant fibers dye, uh, it was, it, it does create this, this heathered look. Uh, and that was part of it. So we were dyeing the protein, not the plant. And so we would get these little um, bumps of cotton, um, these little kind of white, but they'll, they'll stain, dyes will stain those colors, those, those plant fibers, but they won't um, darken the way they will the wool. Yeah. And so yeah, that was part of, you know, the, in, the intended effect or, I don't know that it was intended, but it was, how will this work? So we went to the dye pots, tried it out and said, oh, we like this. And camel is a fiber that um, comes from the camel, uh, the humped camel. And it has a fiber that we also use um, in a blend where we use cashmere. So I would have liked to have used a lot more cashmere than is in that particular blend, but from a cost perspective, I wanted it to be something more accessible to more knitters. So cashmere comes from the cashmere goat. Camel comes from the camel. Two very different animals, but both produce a fiber that has short and long fibers that have to be painstakingly separated. And it's more difficult to do that on cashmere than camel. Camel comes in this beautiful caramel color. And yeah. so we can get some nice dye effects by using this blended with this more acru colored cashmere and some other fibers. And we just use these fibers primarily for their luxurious nature, their softness. And um, they do create a, a, a very warm garment, but because they are so uh, soft um, and uh, with a crimp and uh, lightness to it, 
you can get a warm garment without it being very heavy. And is that your uh, road to China? Exactly. That, so yeah. yeah, so that was, I don't have a sample with me, but the original blend for road to China was um, camel, cashmere, uh, yak fiber. We used a dark brown yak fiber in that. We used a, a product at the time. It wasn't silk. It was called soy silk. And then we used baby alpaca. So it actually had five um, different fibers in it. And uh, the Carter operator used to be very angry every time it was time to do, do a new <laughs> run of Road to China because you have to measure out the fiber every so many meters on the feed that goes into the Carter. And so there she was, bless her, doing measuring out five different fibers to get them exactly right so they would meter out on the other end. So you've had a lot of fun, haven't you? <laughs> uh, it's been a lot of fun and it continues to be a lot of fun. So Daphne, I'll just ask one final question. We're going off a little bit from uh, the topics that we've done so far. And that is, what could you give us your thoughts on the relationship between feminism and handcrafting? And I particularly wanted to ask you this question because you've come out of a very high-powered um business corporate world that's very masculine dominated and then you went into the world of knitting which is traditionally very domesticated and very feminine so just tell us some of your thoughts on this and maybe even just start off with um, a bit of personal experience because I can imagine you're jet setting around in the corporate world and you might even be sitting in business class and your colleagues are by you and they're pulling out their computers and doing their final graphs and, and figures for a business deal and you bring out your knitting needles and your yarn. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have an experience like that? That um, Yeah. Well, yes, uh, I did. Um, and that's that's it's kind of exactly some of, some of my memories of once I started knitting again as an adult uh, were exactly like that. They they were on on an airplane in business class with uh, often direct reports who didn't dare say anything when I pulled my needles out. But it was a way <laughs> for me to relax and spend the time on that airplane preparing for what I might have to do once I, I landed. And so I did it anyway. But it, it, was, it was something that kind of was always there. It's like, I'm a little embarrassed by this. Um, would a serious woman in business do this kind of thing? Um, yeah. It really, it was not until I invested in that mill and said, okay, I've made a big investment here. I've got to turn this into something. And I got involved in knitting as a business and, that made me realize that actually everything we do as women has value. Um, knitting can be a hobby and it can be a business. And yeah. for, for those who, who are in the business of knitting, many of those businesses are led by women and often many of them feed their families with their knitting. Um, I think one of the, the most interesting things, uh, if you look at feminism and handcrafting, is you don't have to look that far in history, although it does go back far in history. But all we have to do really is look as recently as this past January. And the world could not understand why there would be so many people who would make these pussy hats. What was yeah. going on? But women, women all over the world decided that they were going to use their power and they knew their power. They, they know you can make a scarf, just a simple scarf, a square hat, and you can do that and you feel the power that every stitch has in it. And, and that's what they were showing. Um, and they wanted their voices to be heard and they did it using craft. I love that. I, it's been a journey for me from those days when I was a little embarrassed to to realizing that actually feminism and handcrafting actually equals hope to me. I have a nephew. He's in his mid thirties. He's a feminist. He's an activist. He knits. He knit yeah. 10 pussy hats, one for himself and the rest for his women friends who didn't know how to knit. And he, uh, they all boarded a bus and went to Washington, D.C. to protest in January. And just yesterday, he sent me a picture. He has finished his welcome blanket, which is another pro project for craftivism for immigrants that is um, at a museum in Chicago. And he just completed that. So I look at people like my nephew and I say, you know, 
he's 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 not a woman, but there he is, you know, embarking yeah. on feminism and handcrafting and standing up for what he believes in. And, and I just see it all as being about hope. So uh, we we uh, we saw that as a very powerful expression of of what handcrafting can do. And ever since there certainly hasn't been a week that goes by that I don't think about that and think about what that means for us as a brand and what that means for that woman who knit maybe for the first time her own hat and went out and marched and and showed the power that she has in her own hands to create change. And it's, it's made me say, uh, I want to, I want to, to be the brand that's there for that woman. What does she need or want from us? Obviously we sold a lot of pink yarn in earlier in the year, (laughs) Um, but we want to be there and have the conversations and 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 stand united with this group because uh, we just love what they've done and um, we feel very much a part of that. So from those early days of being quite embarrassed to um, saying, oh, I'll bring it on, let, let, I'll show the world what each stitch can, can do and create. That's such a great answer. Thank you. (laughs) So thank you, Daphne. It's been wonderful to have you on the podcast and it's been great to hear about all of the fibres that you work with and it it gives um, certainly me and I'm sure a lot of the viewers much more of an intimate connection when you're looking at a yarn and you see what's in it and, and you understand it more. So thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Andrea. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to the audience now. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. T'was on one bright March morning I bid New Orleans adieu And I took the road to Jackson to renew I cursed a foreign body no credit could I gain which filled the heart with longing for the lakes of Pontchartrain I stepped And I rode the road till evening And I laid me down again All strangers here, no friends to me Till a dark girl towards me came And I fell in love with a creed of Pontchartrain I said my pretty Creole girl me money here's no good if it weren't for the Sleep out in the wood. You're welcome here, kind stranger. Our house is very plain, but we never turn a stranger out at the lakes of Pontchartrain. She took And she treated me quite well The hair upon her shoulders In jet black ringlets fell To try and paint her beauty I'm sure it would be in vain So handsome was me, 
She had got another, and he was far at sea. She said that she would wait for him, and true, she would remain till he returned. 